I'm Mike Boris and this is Straight Talk. Major General Mick Ryan, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Good, thanks. Can I just get protocols right? I'm going to call you Mick if that's okay with you. Mick is perfect. <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, for my sake, uh, I don't really know much about armed forces um, in terms of protocols or where people see it or et cetera. So what's a major general, just for my edification? Um, the Australian Army is commanded by uh, a three-star general, a lieutenant general, and that is one level above me. So that's where a major general sits in the Australian Army. To become a major general, um, I, I guess you've got to go through, I don't know, Duntroon or something like that. Is like, do, do you sort of do a, an officer's course or you start off as a soldier, you know, with a gun over your shoulder sort of, you know, snipering or what? How does it all work? How do you become a major general? Um, well, we all start off with a rifle <laughs> over our shoulder, um, as it may be. But uh, yeah, Duntroon, every single Australian Army officer um, is trained and educated at the Royal Military College Duntroon here in Canberra, whether they're a regular officer or a reserve officer. Um, they are all trained on, at that officer course at Duntroon. How's that all work? Like, how's that program get get established, and then you know, and you work your way through the ranks. So, so let me tell you how it worked for me. I applied to go to the Australian Defence Force Academy at 15 years old to study civil engineering and then become an army officer to be an army engineer. Um, I went to the academy when I turned 17, and that was in 1987. Uh, I was a failure. I failed every single subject. Uh, I think that's still a record, actually. Uh, but there was a great commandant of the academy at that point by the name of Major General Peter Day, and he kind of put his arm around me and said, hey, Mick, um, not a very successful academic year, was it? I said, well, no, sir, it really wasn't. I said, And he said, well, I think you might make a half-decent army leader. How about we send you over the hill because Duntrin's on the other side of the hill from the academy? He said, why don't we, you just do the army officer course and we'll see how you go from there. I did. Uh, I went through Duntrin successfully, made lifelong friends. And the next time I saw Major General Peter Day, uh, was when i just been promoted to a Major General myself. And I saw him and I, I gave him a big hug and said, thank you. Um, being kicked out of the academy uh, was the best thing that ever happened for me because it taught me about failure and it also taught me the importance of second chances. That's very interesting. And when you went over the hill to Duntroon, is that, that course or that program more about uh leadership and strategies as, a, in, as as opposed to becoming like an engineer, learning about physics and various other sort of academic, academic sort of theoretical stuff? It is primarily a leadership college. I mean, we in the Army think it's the best leadership school in Australia, and that's something I strongly believe. Uh, but the first six months is teaching you to be a soldier. Um, so the first six months, you cover just about everything that a normal Army recruit would cover at Kapuka. And you start working up into larger and larger teams and then leading larger and larger teams. And then the second and third six-month periods, you're really starting to get into leadership at different levels and starting to learn about how leadership at your level as a lieutenant, lieutenant in the Army connects into high levels of command all the way up to um, you know, strategy and, and strategic outcomes. You spent, what, 30, 40, I mean, no, you're probably not that old, but 30 years as a Major General in the Army? Would, would not as a Major right? General. <laughs> no, I sorry, spent, I mean in the Army and you come out as a Major General. Would you have been 30 years in the in the Armed Services? So I retired officially last Sunday um, after 35 years, one month and 11 days as an wow. Australian soldier. Um, and to be frank with you, Mark, I can't imagine living a better life than what I did in those 35 years. And then did you, obvious question, like for, for someone like me, did you see action? Did you, I mean, did you, I don't know, did you go anywhere that like that we would have all heard of more recently in terms of Afghanistan, Iraq or something like that? All those places. Um, uh, East Timor in 2000 with the 6th Battalion Royal Australian Regiment Group, which was uh, an amazing deployment led by a fantastic um, Army Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, very, very good leader, and he was an exemplar for me for the rest of my career. I served in Iraq, in Baghdad, under the Americans in 2005, and that was that was a very interesting time. Um, lots of IEDs, lots of rockets, lots of time on the streets 
of Bad, Baghdad, including uh, Sada City. And then um, not long after that, um, came home, moved to Darwin, and then took my engineer regiment to Afghanistan. And I led the first reconstruction task force there in 2006, 2007. So it was a fairly hectic uh, seven, eight years. And not long after that, I was actually sent to the Pentagon to work with the Americans on on strategic issues for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. The Joint Chiefs, what does that mean? The Joint Chiefs are the most senior military leaders in the United States military. It's the chiefs of each of their services, so their chief of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, um, Space Force and National Guard. And they are the principal advisors to the chairman, who is the principal military advisor to uh, the President of the United States, they had a small team that was established to develop and implement strategy for Pakistan and Afghanistan, and I was part of that small team. That sort of brings us to where we are today, or from my point of view it is. So we've got the President of the United States of, the, of America at the moment. Um, he is being advised in relation to the conflict that's going on in the Ukraine with Russia um, by the Chairman of the Chief of Staffs and the Chief of staff is sitting around there talking to your equivalent and many others. There might be, you know, 10 or 12 of them. And they've been telling Biden, look, let's not get involved in this conflict <laughs> in, in a physical sense. Let's just, you know, or is that or is that NATO or is it the relationship with that NATO determines whether or not he gets involved in the physical conflict? I mean, how's that how's the ship work? Like you know, we're all jumping up and down, you know, Go and help these poor buggers. Um, but, you know, he sort of looks like he's got his hands tied to me. Where would the advice be coming from? Or is it, is it him? Is it him? Is he the dude who makes the call? Uh, the president uh, makes the call because ultimately getting involved in wars is a political, not a military decision. Um, militaries in democracies do not decide uh, when or where or who to go to war with. That is a political decision. Um, so the president is the ultimate decision maker and he is advised by Secretary of State, the equivalent of our Minister for Foreign Affairs. He's advised by the Secretary of Defence. He will have economic advisers. The congressional leadership in both the Senate and the House uh, will advise him because, remember, Congress holds the purse strings in the American system, particularly when it comes to military activities such as this. Um, but the President will look at his principal military advisor, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, currently General Mark Milley, and say, if we were to do this, General, um, what could we do to provide support? What could we do in this scenario? And his principal military advisor will come back with, with different options for supporting the Ukrainians or the pros and cons of, for example, a no-fly zone, as we saw them discuss over the weekend. The US is a member of NATO. What's his consideration of that uh, in terms of maybe voting or whatever he might be doing or even influencing NATO to introduce an I-fly, a no-fly zone, for example, over Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, the United States, uh, as you just described, Mark, is a member of NATO. It's a very important member, but it's one member of a large alliance um, and it has both political and military dimensions. The major decisions about where to get involved, the degree of resources allocated, um, are undertaken by the NATO Council, which is political, um, as it should be in democratic systems. And then they would task the military elements of the alliance to look at options for implementing the political objectives that NATO has set for them. So at the moment over the weekend, we saw NATO say we don't want a no-fly zone, and I can talk through the reasons for that. I think at this point there are good reasons for that. Um, but we do want to do these things to support Ukraine. Um, military leaders, get off and uh, go start doing these things that meet our political objectives we've set. Once again, politics is all pervading and we've just seen that the whole political um, agenda pervade the whole COVID um, operation for the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, like to a large extent that is a political agenda and I'm not making a commentary one way or the other. Um, but again, politics pervades the military outcomes of what's going on in Ukraine or probably more importantly in, in Europe as a whole at the moment. Where do you think, well, do you mind explaining what your interpretation of the no-fly zone perhaps rationale is? Hmm, sure. So a no-fly zone is where you uh, establish a piece of airspace uh, through which uh, others are not to fly through. 
In this case, the proposal was that NATO and the United States establish a zone over Ukraine over which the Russians could not fly. Now, you can't just say, don't fly through that zone. If you're going to set a no-fly zone, you must enforce it. And in the enforcement, it is almost certain that NATO or US warplanes would uh, be in combat with Russian airplanes. Um, now, the reason that's problematic is there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it certainly risks a, a war with Russia between NATO and Russia rather than just Ukraine and Russia as it is at the moment. That also risks an escalation of the war beyond the current um, national boundaries of Ukraine. Russia may decide that if NATO is enforcing a no-fly zone, it may decide that it wants to attack all the air bases in Europe from which the aircraft to enforce that no-fly zone are coming from. And then we might see an escalation from there all the way up to low likelihood, but even some kind of nuclear activity from the Russians. So not having a no-fly zone at the moment makes sense to avoid that kind of escalation. The other side of this, Mark, too, is the vast, vast majority of the murder of civilians in Ukraine by the Russians is being conducted by ground forces, by tanks, by artillery, by rockets, both short and long range. So. A no-fly zone actually, unfortunately, is not going to have an impact on saving civilians in Ukraine. And even if there was a no-fly zone, the Russians would keep doing it. They just wouldn't be using aircraft to do it. So I think at this point in time, a no-fly zone uh, is not viable. Um, the risks of escalation and the impact on the ground are just too many. Mick, everyone keeps talking about escalation. Um and it's fair enough. I mean, that's the and that's a, it's a, it's a political outcome escalation. It's not a military consideration because military say, "Well, you do this, and we'll defend, or we'll attack, or whatever you know, whatever the case may be." Um, so it's it's politically unsavory or unpal not pal unpalatable, um, unpalatable, I should say. Um, but what does escalation mean, really? I mean, it's does it mean that he's going to, like, let's say we impose an no-fly zone, etc., and he sees that as some form of declaration of war, or, or you know, or, you know, he just says you're a transgressor, you're you're now supporting Ukraine. I've told you, I've warned you before. What does that mean? Does he does that just mean he's going to push tanks into uh, I don't know other places like Poland or whatever? Or what's he do? I mean, put, putting aside nuclear war because nuclear war seems to me to be no option for anybody because, you know, he's in as much danger as anybody else. So what does it mean in an uh, other nuclear, what does it mean in an escalation sense? When we talk about escalation, uh, there's a few ways wars escalate. One, they can escalate uh, geographically by overflowing the boundaries of the original site of the conflict. So in this case, it might be that uh, it could uh, overflow into surrounding countries. That would be a significant escalation. Um, that would draw in other countries into the conflict, which at the moment is a, is a Russia-Ukraine conflict, notwithstanding the, the tremendous international support for Ukraine. Um, we could also see an escalation in the size of the conflict with the size of the forces that are committed from Russia and from other countries. We also might see an escalation in the kinds of weapons that are used. Um, we see longer, longer range rockets used, more rockets used, more aircraft with precision munitions used. So there's a, there's a, like there's a lateral and a, both a horizontal and a vertical uh, dimension to escalation, both of which are possible uh, if a no-fly zone is, is established and enforced by NATO and the United States. I'm a pretty sort of simple guy in this sort of regard. I mean, this is like a negotiation to me. And he's basically gets up there and says to everybody, I'm talking about Putin, but basically gets up there and tells everybody, you dare do that, um, you guys are dust, I'm going to sort you. And uh, everybody's going, Which whoa, he's already whoa. said. He said it. And, and everyone's going, whoa, shit, like uh, maybe we're not ready for it or we're scared of him or we don't want an escalation. But whilst he's doing that, he's just going to, whilst we do nothing based on what he says, he just continues on his merry way doing what he wants to do, um, taking over a country that's uh, the sovereignty of another country, killing people left, right and centre, creating um, a massive migration uh, from, from Ukraine to other places who can't handle it, 
um, and just terrorising the world generally on, based on, on every principle that you can imagine in this 2022 period with something you would never expect to see. Um, how do you stand up? I mean, everyone calls you a bully, blah, 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 but how do you – you're a major general, I mean, and how do you stand up? At what point do you say, that's enough, dude, stop, or, you know, someone's going to – you're going to get consequences yourself. We're going to escalate. Well, that's exactly what the Ukrainians have done in the last 12, 12 days, right? I mean, the whole reason Putin arrayed 190,000 troops around the borders of Ukraine was to try and overawe them and scare them into political concessions. I mean, at heart, Putin is a bluffer. A lot of strategy is actually about bluffing. Um, the Ukrainians called their bluff in the worst possible way f- for Putin. Um, the Ukrainians have shown up the the Russian military as both arrogant and not as competent as a lot of Western military analysts had hoped. But they've also uh, made this a war, the kind of war Putin didn't want, which is a long war. Putin wanted a quick political concession from the president and the government of Ukraine. They've basically said to Putin, nope, not going to happen. We like this democracy stuff and we're going to fight to it. We're going to fight to it probably to the end. Um, So what that means is Putin is running out of time. Time is not on Putin's side, but is on the Ukrainian side. Um, He is in a lot of trouble internationally with the sanctions and international opinion against him, but he's also in a lot of trouble domestically because very few people in Russia knew about this war that was in prospect, and they've kept um, information about the war from the Russian people. They won't do that forever. They can't do that forever. And as they start seeing coffins of their young men coming home, uh, I think opinion in Russia will start going more and more against Putin. He's in trouble. Would that be the thinking of your current equivalents who are sitting in the chief of staff's offices and the various places in NATO equivalents and sort of um, and the, who are advising their political, let's call it masters, so to speak, um, advising their political masters, are they saying, Exactly that. It's this is a long war as opposed to what Putin wanted. There's going to become political pressure for Putin, apart from all the financial pressure that the rest of the world is putting on him. But there'll be start to be political pressure on Putin because my gut feeling is Putin couldn't give a damn. I don't reckon um, he cares. No, I think that's exactly what a lot of senior military and, and political people are already saying is that this is a massive uh, miscalculation. I think as one British strategist said he called this a delusional strategy from Putin, and I think there's a lot to it. And Putin's delusional strategy is the original sin here, and just about every mistake the Russian military have made have flown from poor uh, Putin's strategy. Um, But they'll also be providing options to political leaders, that's Western military leaders, about what they can do now and what they might do in the next steps. I mean, the next steps may well be Um, support to some form of a Ukrainian insurgency, at least in some parts of the country. So they'll be looking at that. They'll be uh, providing options to their political leaders and then political leaders will be deciding, do we want to support such an insurgency? How might we do that? How far do we want to go? As I understand it, he put 150,000 sort of troops and a whole lot of heavy artillery, et cetera, in places like Belarus, uh, clearly Crimea, um, and then on the eastern boundary um, with uh, uh, Ukraine, we're all saying, look, he, surely he's not going to go to war. This is just a, a bit of blustering. He's trying to, you know, stop Ukraine from joining NATO and put pressure on the world to, or NATO at least to stop Ukraine from becoming a NATO member. Were people like you saying, well, hang on a minute, he's not going to spend that much money, that much, much, that much time and effort just to put that pressure on uh, NATO, he's he's going to make a strike at some stage. Was that your gut feeling that, like, this is just too much, too much momentum? Oh, absolutely. I was in Washington, D.C. Um, the week and a half before this all started, and that was the, the topic of conversation. And my, my response when I was asked this was, I think it's about a 80, 70 to 80% chance uh, that he'll do this. Um, just remembering, too, that wars don't always start through calculation. They start through miscalculation. That's kind of the history of warfare over the last 5,000 years. And, and Putin miscalculated. He expected the Ukrainians to roll over, and they haven't. So he's had to go in. Whether he wants to or not, he's had to. Now, we should remember, too, that the Russian army is just short of 300,000 soldiers. Putin's committed 200,000 already. He's in trouble because he hasn't met any of his 
short-term objectives yet with that 200,000 soldiers he's already committed. What does he do? Does he double down? Does he, you know, as an engineer might say, throw more dirt in the mud? Um, you know, there are very few good options for Putin here. And at heart, there is no long-term political success for him here. Even if he takes Ukraine, he has to do it by destroying it. He mean, That means he'll be ruling rubble with 44 million Ukrainians who hate him and an international community that see him as a pariah. I mean, there just isn't a political solution here that's good for Putin in the long term. That worries me. So in terms of, okay, let's, so let's talk tactics and strategy. So, and let's talk about Kiev, which clearly that's where he wants to, oh, not clearly, it seems to me he wants to control Kiev for spiritual reasons or a whole lot of cultural reasons or whatever the case may be in terms of the original Rus people and Kiev being the, you know, the spiritual capital of the whole joint. Um, can you, it, it looks like to me he's going to surround the joint and perhaps just starve them out, you know, no power, no food, no electricity, you know, terror in the skies uh, and they all just walk out and put their hands up. Is that sort of what he's trying to do here? And, uh, apart from the Ukrainian resistance, put that aside for a second, just park that, uh, which they're doing very successfully. But do you think, is that his thinking? Let, let me just surround the joint. I'm going to send missiles out over all night. People are going to go, my God, I can't stay in here forever. I've got family, kids. There's probably a couple million people live there. And then once he gets that, then he's going to say, let's sit down and talk? Or what do you think is he's th – and what about uh, Zelensky? Is he going to try and grab him? Oh, I think the Russian playbook is pretty clear. It's what they used in Syria. It's what they've used in Mariupol and other cities, and that is attempt to surround it, to cut it off from sources of external support, and then bombard it um, to terrorise the people and coerce the political leadership into surrendering as we've seen from every Russian city so far that they've tried that in, it hasn't worked very well. And even Kherson was, you know, they may now have an occupying force in there, but whether they can maintain that is another question. So I don't think there's any doubt that the Russians are at least trying to surround Kiev. But, you know, you're talking about setting up a cordon around the city that's at least 90 kilometres long. That alone will take a huge amount of the Russian ground force that's currently in Ukraine. And then if they, if the Ukrainians say, well, hey, you can surround us, but we're not surrendering, they've got to go in there and attempt to capture the or kill uh, government and military leadership. That too is a really dangerous, it's very destructive, and it's a bloody form of warfare that, to be quite frank, most military leaders try and avoid. It's just so difficult and it's the worst and the most destructive form of warfare for both soldiers and civilians that you can imagine. But do you think that Putin, whilst you say that, um, just doing what Putin's doing is the sort of thing that military leaders wouldn't do anyway, um, do you think there is a bit of madness there with uh, Putin or do you think he's now become desperate as opposed to always being mad? Oh, I, I think it's desperation. I can't talk to his mental state at all. But, um, you know, I think there's a level of desperation here. Things have not gone how he saw them how he conceived them in his mind and how he and his whoever he spoke to beforehand thought it would go. He is running out of time. He is getting desperate and he is capable, as we've seen in the past in other places, of the most terrible of deeds to, one, stay in his current position, which is president of Russia, and two, to sustain this nostalgic myth that he has about Russia as a great power and, you know, the centre of, you know, a Russian empire, you know, that he seems to have some genuine nostalgia for. So he is desperate and I think things are going to continue to get worse over the coming days because of that. What do you think someone like Z Zelensky's risk is? Is he going to, do you think Putin will send in, uh, you know, people uh, dressed like Ukrainians or speaking Ukrainian like, you know, like assassins and all that sort of stuff? Are we talking about, uh, you know, movie style uh, outcomes here for Zelensky? Um, we need to be clear, nothing in war is like the movies. Uh, it's never as sanitised, never as clean. Um, it's always just brutal, nasty and awful. Um, we've already seen reports that there have been at least two assassination attempts on Zelensky. I mean, the, the Russians are so desperate, they're bringing in Chechens and mercenaries to do this. 
Um, and I expect they'll continue to do that. I mean, Zelensky has been one of the most successful wartime leaders in memory. I mean, we literally have not seen anyone like him in a generation or more. Uh, for someone who was written off by many Western observers and who Putin obviously has total scorn for, we have a man that is carrying his whole nation on his shoulders. He is leading them and providing them purpose. And he's also assembled a very, at this point, effective international coalition through which lethal and non-lethal aid are flowing, as well as the sanctions regime that's slowly going to strangle Russia. Uh, they can't afford for Zelensky to stay in power. Um, the Russians, I believe, will do everything they possibly can to assassinate him. Um, but at the same time, the Ukrainian people need a leader like him. It's interesting if, if they do assassinate him, it could even make it, it could even galvanise the Ukrainians even more and the rest of the world for that matter. Um, because if for somehow, yeah, I mean, because if he, they, if he puts his head, if Putin puts some uh, Zelensky's head on a pike, so to speak, um, I think that would uh, commit an enormous outrage gl globally and to some extent might even force other people's hands. Do you think Putin at any stage is sitting around thinking, my God, I better not uh, go that far because, like, we're all thinking about him. I better not go that far because these guys could actually really turn on me and, and create wars on many fronts for me in Russia, you know, given that you just said he's 200,000 out of 300,000 committed. Uh, what happens if, you know, Europeans, Western European and, uh, you know, Americans, et cetera, send, you know, another $300,000, uh, 300,000 soldiers onto other borders and he, all of a sudden he's fighting wars on many fronts? Yeah, I think uh, assassinating a national leader, you know, besides being against international war, obviously, uh, would be an outrage. It would be a horrendous outrage added to the, you know, the carnage that the Russians have caused amongst the Ukrainian people. And I, I agree with you. I think we'll see the Ukrainians say, hey, you thought we were cranky before this? Now we're really cranky and we're going to make you really pay um, even more than what we already are. So it would be an outrage, but you would see, as we would in any other democracy, someone will step into his shoes. Um, you know, the prospect of a NATO intervention, you know, we can never discount it. I don't think it's likely at the moment, but the more desperate the Russians become, the more likely we are to see some form of atrocity that might force NATO's hand. Um, I'm not going to try to suggest what that might be because there are all kinds of imaginable and unimaginable um, horrendous things the Russians could do that might result in that. But I, I you know, I think it's unlikely, but we shouldn't discount it. I wonder when you got 40 countries, I think it's 40 countries, remember NATO, when you got 40 countries, how hard is it to get agreement or probably more importantly, trust amongst every single country? I mean, like it's, it's a pretty tough gig, particularly when you're opposing someone like Russia and you're trying to defend someone like Ukraine is not even a member. How hard is that? Have you had some sort of exposure to these these environments? This outside the military, this is more in the politics of it. It happens everywhere. Um, it's not unique to the military. Whenever you bring people from different organisations together, the most important thing you can provide them is common purpose. Um, and that's not always easy. I mean, getting everyone to agree on a common purpose and then working towards it is one of the toughest things that leaders can do, particularly uh, when you talk about uh, different organisations at the national level. It doesn't have to be just military. It could be different corporations. Um, you see it in corporate life. You see it in government. You see it in military institutions. And I certainly, I served in Afghanistan. There were 50 different countries uh, represented there. And information sharing is always one of those difficult issues because we all have a sensitive information related to the defence of our own national security. Uh, we all have processes and procedures by which we uh, collect, analyse and store that information. So that's always an area of great discussion and great interest when you are forming a, a new coalition. Um, and we'll be seeing that behind the scenes as things play out at the moment. Remember, it's not just NATO or the United States that are involved in this massive international effort to support Ukraine. You know, our own country, United, is not part of NATO, but we're part of it and an important part of it. Places like Japan, 
um, and others are also part of it. So, you know, the point you raise is a very valid one, but at the end of the day, it's about um, building and sustaining common purpose, and it's about good leadership. Good leaders are able to bring diverse views and diverse organisations together and make them successful, and that works at every single level. I agree, and, and that's, a, that's an excellent point about leadership. And whilst operationally it would seem, and I'll take your word for it, that Putin's not being that operationally successful um, because he's underestimated the Ukrainian resistance in relation to what he's doing right now in the Ukraine. And he looks like he's getting into perhaps a long war when he wanted, 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 he wanted a short one and a, a submission. But it looks like as a leader of his country, he has profiled NATO very well. Um, he's worked out that NATO probably won't do all the things that Ukraine might call on them to do. And that leads me to the point you were making before, Mick, that it would be a terrible shame that um, NATO finally did, did something because of the level of the atrocity that had to be committed first off by Putin in order to get NATO to coalesce, to come together because, you know, it's, it is a disparate group of nations and, and, and other nations who aren't members as well, like Australia and, you know, uh, Latvia and, you know, Finland and Sweden or whoever is those other ones. Um, it would be a terrible outcome f- from my point of view if they did come together because it will have to be a major atrocity that actually brought them together as one group. And that's where – it seems to me that's when Putin's been – a good bad leader, if you know what I mean. Like being a successful bad leader probably is a better way of putting it. He's profiled the NATO group, the community, as being something really hard to bring together. Yeah, I think um, there's there's certainly some truth to that. But I think in the broad, um, Putin's approach to NATO and dealing with the international community has been a massive failure. I mean, one of the assumptions he went into this war with is that the international community was um, was not unified, that America and the West was in on the decline, that European nations were unwilling to invest in their own defence. Um, and all of that's actually been disproven over the last two weeks. I mean, one of Putin's greatest failures is this total transformation in Germany's view of itself as a provider of security, not just of its own borders, but in the international environment. I mean, Two weeks ago, if someone had suggested that the German Chancellor is going to stand up before his parliament and say, we are going to totally change how we invest in our own defence, we are going to uh, increase it by a significant magnitude, and we are going to defend democracy, not just in Germany. I mean, only Putin could have led to such a profound outcome. That is a massive massive strategic failure on Putin's part. NATO has, for the first time in a generation, been given by Putin again a unifying purpose for for its existence. I mean, these are massive failures of thinking and failures of strategy by Putin and his closest advisors. They're just two of them, and there's lots more I could go on with. So, you know, I think... Once again, going back to this notion of Putin's engaged in a delusional strategy, um, he's misjudged the commun- international community and Ukrainians at every step, and in the long term, he will fail because of that. And that, to me, is quite um, comforting, to be frank with you, um, to hear from someone like you, um, because you know most of us are sitting around, <laughs> you know, every morning after I turn Sky News on or BBC or something like that, I have a quick look at it. This tr- I'm talking about four o'clock in the morning. Because I'm, I'm get, I become obsessed with these sorts of things, um, and I think to myself, bloody hell, uh, what's going on? And I, I look at the the news feed, which is about basically showing us about uh, showing us, uh, you know, apartment buildings getting bombed and people lining up with their kids and having to duck and trying to get out of Ukraine and all that sort of stuff, and 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 every one of those is a very sad thing, a very important thing, but in a broader sense. I, 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 we all forget about, about the broader sense, as you say, it's brought NATO back together again, um, it will be, given them more purpose, particularly when someone like Germany, as you said, said that that's, that's fantastic. And what we have to become, I guess, is more patient, 
but there will be casualty in our patients, period. There's going to be casualty. It, there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, is that something you just have to bear, bear down on and, you know, as, a, as an individual, like someone like me, I just have to grip my teeth and accept that as an as a, um, ultimate outcome of war? Well, I think what we're going to see in the coming years, Mark, is that um, once again, wars aren't fought by military organisations. They're not fought by governments. They're not fought by leaders. They're fought by countries. That was, in some respects, part of the mistake we made in places like in Iraq and Afghanistan, where very, very small parts of the community were involved, tiny parts, uh, you know, very small professional military organisations that deployed you know, their, their forces over and over again. Most of the community wasn't involved and didn't know what was going on. Um, not the community's fault, by the way, but that's just how it played out. Moving forward, Mark, um, we can't afford that approach. Uh, we are seeing again, like we did in the 20th century, the rise of powerful authoritarian regimes that have designs well beyond their borders. Twice in the 20th century, Australian soldiers went to Europe and the Pacific to fight and destroy those authoritarian regimes. Um, if maybe, maybe we can think about this a bit more in advance and maybe uh, we commit the national resources to it, we won't have to do that again in the 21st century. So I guess that brings me to the uh, elephant in the room that everyone keeps talking about. So China's, I don't know where they said, looks looks like on one hand they're friendly but to Russia, but on the other hand they look like they're sort of saying, playing the neutral game um, or at least playing the game. Um, and... Uh, and I, I'm intrigued with China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, but also the, the greater region around China. Um, what do we learn from this? What do we learn from Ukraine, Russia, and Western Europe, East and Western Europe, relative to what we, sh what how our world sits here in Australia, in the Pacific, with uh, China? What do we learn? Well, I think there's a few things. Firstly, you know, China will always do what's in China's interest. It is not some benign superpower that will you know, do things in the interest of the international community. That is just not how they think. Everything they do will be to the benefit of China and in particular the benefit of the old men that run the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. So we should never, ever forget that. First and foremost, the Chinese Communist Party will do everything it can to stay in power. Um, secondly, um, I think the Chinese have been shocked at the speed of the international response and the unified approach that the vast majority, remember just about every country in the world signed on to the UN um, resolution about the war in Ukraine. I think the Chinese have been shocked by that. They've also been shocked that by some of the new age ideas about war in the 21st century that the Russians have developed and the Chinese have studied have not been proven yet. In fact, they've been found wanting. Um, and fourth, the Chinese look at Russia going into Ukraine, which is next door with a land border, and then look at 180 kilometres between China and Taiwan and think, wow, this is actually a big operational problem. We need to really think this through. Um, my hope, my fervent wish is that the Chinese look at this and go, you know what, maybe an invasion of Taiwan just isn't something we want to undertake. Um, it's something that's beyond us and would result in such destruction and bloodshed and resistance from the Taiwanese, it's not worth their while. And whether they'll take that lesson or not, I don't know, but gee, I hope they do. If you mention that Russia's got 300,000 troops and they've got 140 something million people living in the country, we've got 25, 26 million people in the country. How many uh, personnel do we have? I mean, wh wh where's our number? Is it 10,000? How many army people do we have? In Australia. Yeah, so the, the Australian Defence Force has about 68,000 regular people um, and about another 20, 25,000 reserve people at the moment. Um, so, you know, we are not a large organisation. It's a high-quality one. But remember, we never fight alone. Um, the Australian military always fights as part of a bigger team and fighting as a team is how you uh, increase your strength. It's how you increase your ability to cover more things at once. And frankly, the team that we always fight on is the one with the, the values that we share of freedom, democracy, liberty, and freedom of expression, religion, 
Um, you know, so the power of the Australian military is its capacity to fight as part of a larger team. That's interesting in that, you know, we're talking about our alliance with the US and the UK and, and Japan, the, the, uh, and, and, and I, I think also India is part of that uh, m- m- most recent uh, AUKUS group. Um, would we get a situation like NATO is currently saying, I know, I know Ukraine is not part of NATO, but NATO is sort of saying, no, we're not in this war. Would, do you think the US would come to our aid if we were, you know, being approached to be invaded by another place? Do you think um, the US would actually come to our aid, like bring ships over or whatever, because we're a long way away from everywhere? I mean, do you think that would happen? Do you really think that would happen? Uh, you know, I think the relationship between the United States and Australia is close, not just at a government or a military level, but at a societal level. I mean, Americans look at Australians and kind of see a version of themselves. Um, And I think that if Australia was under a direct threat, now I don't think it is, I think that is such an enormous logistical problem that there are no countries on earth that are capable of it at the moment. But, you know, um, we've seen in the last two years with the Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy and their coercive activities against Australia, America came out almost straight away in our support. They came out and said, listen, stop this economic coercion against Australia. We don't like it. Uh, We are with the Australians. We are going to support them. And it's not in anyone's interest for you to do that. So, you know, um, the Americans, once again, will do what's in their interest, as they should and as we do. But, you know, we have an alliance with the United States. We have the AUKUS relationship. Um, There's the Quad and a whole range of other existing mechanisms that I would expect but, you know, if something happened, it's highly likely that the Americans would come to our aid. When, I, when you were talking, I was thinking about stuff and I was thinking about India poised there with Pakistan and India who don't necessarily get on, but then uh, India and Pakistan don't really get on with China. Um, you know, and, you know, we're talking about quite a few billion people between the two. Uh, you got Japan and Taiwan on the other side. You got North Korea and South Korea. Now you got this sort of uh, problem in, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. I mean, has, has it ever been like this before? Like, it feels like we're on, we're sitting on a tinderbox. Do you, is that is that is that a a real thing? I mean, or is that just my imagination? I oh, know. I think the strategic environment at the moment is highly uncertain. I mean, with the reemergence of China as an economic and military power, I mean, Russia's view of the world and what it's done in the Ukraine. I mean, we're seeing greater uncertainty and greater friction in international relations. Um, The strategic competition by China and the United States will be one of the most preeminent elements uh, in the thinking of Australian strategists and uh, national leaders for the next couple of decades. You know, it will shape how we invest in our military. It will shape our economy. It will shape how we look at other national security issues such as cyber, uh, information, internal domestic security considerations with different spies who might be here. So, you know, we are seeing a different environment. It's more uncertain. And I think the investments that different Australian governments, the Australian governments have made in the last decade in particular, are really important and will require further investments in both the size and quality of the Australian Defence Force and other national security elements. I, I, I guess the... Obvious question I want to ask you, now you're retired um, and I, I presume you stay on as a Major General, you, you never lose that title. Um, Mick Ryan sits back now and does he just say, well, I'm, I'm not in the military anymore, I don't think about these sorts of things or what's someone like Mick Ryan do now? Um, I don't think I can ever do that, to be quite frank. I mean, I, I published a book on uh, war in the 21st century two weeks ago I've spent 35 years investing in thinking about uh, this profession of arms and and what it does. Um, And, you know, I had hoped last Monday, my first day of retirement, I have a bit of a sleep in and a break and time with family. Um, But the other side of it too is the Australian taxpayer, the Australian people um, who I've served for my entire adult life have invested in me for 35 years. They've invested in my knowledge and in my capabilities. And to be quite honest with you, Mark, I feel a profound responsibility to play some part, a small part, uh, as it may, 
uh, in keeping the Australian people informed about what they're actually seeing in places like Ukraine, try and translate some of the military and government jargon, some of the disturbing, awful things that the Russians are doing, and try and you know educate and inform people so they can appreciate what's going on, but also understand why we as a nation are now in a very, very different security environment than what we've been in for the last couple of hundred years. Well, Major General Mick Ryan, I really appreciate that your interpretation of what's going on, um, but probably more importantly, um, indulging me with my questions, but taking us through with your you know high quality answers. But I want to ask you one final question. Um, given that there is a, a new normal, so to speak, um, should normal people, average people here in Australia worry or do they, should would they be sitting back and thinking to themselves, well, we're in pretty good hands, um, we've done all we can in terms of alliances, et cetera. We will reconsider how much money we need to spend. Governments will reconsider how much money we need to spend and therefore we should be okay. How should they feel? I think um, it's not about worrying. I think it's about keeping themselves informed about what's going on. I think an informed citizen is the most powerful thing. It is the superpower of democracies. And well-informed citizens that can make uh, good decisions about the kind of governments they elect um, and the kind of priorities that those governments come into gov- into you know, office with is really, really important. So, you know, I'd say to the citizens of this country I love deeply and and have loved serving, um, don't worry, but please be informed and please be able to understand uh, through being informed what's going on in the world around you and why governments and national security organisations and military organisations in this country are doing the kind of things that they're doing to defend our nation. How do I keep informed? What's what's a source that I can be come informed by, which is has no agenda sitting on top of it, a political agenda? I'm sorry, I'm talking about here. Are there sources well, that you look at that I could look at? I, I, <laughs> I, would, I have available to me the same ones as you do. I yeah. read lots and lots of different newspapers, um, and my approach to this is have a wide, diverse range of sources in print, in the media. Um, personal, um, and that's the only way to stay informed. Don't get stuck in an echo chamber of any single source, which doesn't matter where you sit on, sit on the spectrum of politics. Um, get outside of echo chambers. Look at views from across the different spectrum. It's not about uh, agreeing with them. It's about understanding different viewpoints because at the end of the day, uh, democracies are built on compromise. They're not built on extremist views. Um, and the way to compromise is to put yourself in the shoes of other people and understand their perspectives. Do you, do you put out Instagram or tweets or Facebook or do you do podcasts yourself? I mean, if you were doing a podcast, it was like, or a YouTube series, which is like literally 10 minute summary every week or once every two weeks about what you've seen with no political agenda, I would definitely listen to it. So just, maybe just an idea for you. I, maybe you're already doing it, but yeah. that, I, we need something like that. I have a Twitter feed which I, I put a, an analysis of Ukraine on every single day, uh, the, the handles war in the future, um, and I also uh, write, um, I've been writing articles for decades, but, you know, my book War Transforms just come out. I have a couple more that uh, with publishers, and I also uh, publish opinion pieces in the Australian media. Thanks very much. Major General Mick Ryan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your um uh, unpacking of what's going on at the moment. M- maybe in uh, in a month's time or two months' time, we could catch up again and just have a look at where we landed. Um, hopefully, th- this does not get escalated, though. Appreciate your time. It's been wonderful to talk to you, mate. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate the invitation. It's been uh, terrific speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.